Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm here to usher you guys into the weekend of July 31st. Going into August, there's a lot happening this weekend and also this week. Let's dive into a little bit of news before I talk about some in-depth topic with the city of Missoula. And I also got a special school board report for you guys on whether or not the school is deciding to um, approach this upcoming 2020-2021 fiscal school year. Um, tripling of destinations and doubling of capacity when it comes to Alaska Airlines, according to Brett Callen, manager, director of Alaska Airlines, capacity planning and alliances said that the airline will be putting $30 million, $30 million capital into Missoula International Airport. The Missoulian article said that that increased travel to and from California cities such as San Jose, San Diego, and San Francisco. Um, Alaska Airlines is based out of Seattle, Washington, and what has been a source of travel between many Missoulians and the Seattle area will increase it to those locations. Missoula International Airport also mentioned earlier last June that it, they expected a slump in travel in the first quarter of 2020. Only $26,000 was generated, which is down 16% from um, that quarter of 2019. Alaska is investing the $30 million into Missoula, which these plans have been in a uh, back burner for some time now. This is a big deal because this would open up international flights to China, Japan, Australia, and so on. Many different um, connections to be able to connect to California, which does a lot of flights to and from um, uh, Asian continents as well. Um, as Montana is seeing increases in COVID-19 around the state. Many other communities in the nation are struggling with keeping businesses open. While many businesses are trying to cope with the many mandatory rules for entry for their stores, many people have been taken a, a, away uh, in unmarked vehicles and the New York Police Department is joining the federal agents in taking people into custody. A video shows a woman being stopped and getting pulled into an unmarked van. Many protesters started surrounding it, but as soon as the protesters surrounded it, a bunch of cops on their bikes uh, supported uh, a lot of those, uh, the um, unidentified police officers um, in uh, uh, taking um, the protester into custody. See, it's interesting how to figure out the right words to kind of describe what's going on, but this is kind of a, uh, what's happening in New York uh, with the police officers. Uh, but in um, Portland, one of the big things that were happening in the last couple of weeks is that federal agents have been deployed in Portland to take back uh, City Hall when it was uh, taken over by protesters. Federal agents and protesters for the last couple of weeks have clashed with protesters to take control of City Hall. Big Uriah is Attorney General for the United States, appeared in front of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, uh, the Attorney General, William Barr, uh, was the one who um, sent the order to... Uh, uh, so he went in front of the House of Representatives to uh, get questions for use of excessive force on civilians, but claims that because of civil unrest and violence um, have fueled these actions. Of course, this meeting went on for five hours. Uh, Democrats clashed with Barr without getting into real uh, rationale for his actions, and Barr reflected on many questions throughout. Republicans released a video montage of the violence from protesters, which included the Minneapolis police depreciation that was set ablaze uh, back in... Um, earlier in the protests. The meeting went on to more detail about how uh, mail-in ballots could, in, uh, infil could be infiltrated in the upcoming election. According to a previous story from the New York Times, many states have conducted mail-in ballots with no security problems in the past. Uh, just earlier on Thursday, Trump tweeted, um, quote, 2020 will be the most um, inaccurate and fraudulent election in history, and he's referring to mail-in ballots or absentee ballots. Um, it is very impossible to steal people's votes, which requires a lot of research on people and where they live. Uh, many people are hired to uh, work on the polling places, check the names, um, reference it to the address as well, and all that work would be put into effect to steal one vote. It's, uh, it's the idea that you go into the system and you push the button that would uh, increase the votes for one person over another, which is impossible. The many uh, votes are done through machines. People check the ballots, make sure that everything's in there. And even a lot of the time, if the dots aren't even filled in, the vote will not be counted at all. So uh, sometimes it's, it's a very interesting kind of system in place. Um, many communities, which you should look into, have uh, used absentee ballots, especially rural communities, which are already so far away from their 
uh, county polling places, and it's being used for a lot of folks as well. The National Conference of State Legislatures states, the ballot of an elector who casts an absentee ballot shall be counted even if the elector dies on or before the election day. So if they get the absentee ballot, they fill it out, and then they die, the absentee ballot is still viable. Um, of course, this is that's that's like a really kind of interesting loophole, but it it's not a... a a big concern for a lot of absentee ballots. Um, of course, here's a lot. Of, that's a lot of news that are happening in and around the world today. Um, but here's a couple new programs going to be airing on MCAT this weekend that you guys can enjoy as well. And then when I come back, I'm going to be talking about some movies that are coming out this weekend and a video game too. So stay with me. The kinds of maps that DeLil would have been using, although it's much more recent, and what's really fascinating about this map is it's from 1795. It was made by the King of Spain Surveyor General of Upper Louisiana. And Antoine Soulard, um, he was a guy who fled France because they were going to guillotine him. And uh, he, he came via Massachusetts, went down the Ohio River, and got to St. Louis that way. Um, he was a farmer. He was not a cartographer. And he got maps from fur traders, uh, people like uh, Jean-Baptiste Trudeau, um, these guys who were going out from St. Louis and collecting native maps and using native maps to get from point A to point B. They were using the kinds of maps that their customers and clientele used, right? A lot of people do when a disaster hits they'll stay close to home but you have more and more people that are moving across borders and um, and there's no climate ref there's no sort of climate refugee status there's in the definition in the international definition of refugees as known by the United Nations there's no allowance for climate change in that definition um, there's no country that has a status for for climate change refugee one exception it, and it might already be ex an exception, is New Zealand. And New Zealand has, I believe that this might have passed, and they, they have legislation out there for, to accept like 200 people per year from Pacific Islands who are displaced due to sea level rise. If we go back to looking at the name, whether it's Spanish flu or sometimes it was called Flanders fever or bird flu, it's interesting to know that this particular epidemic probably started in 1918 right in Kansas. So we could just as easily rename it the Kansas flu. One of the things I think we all need to understand when we talk about pandemic, it's such an alarming term. And of course, when pandemics hit, they do go around the world. But what, what we are really concerned about is that when you have a pandemic, What's at the crux of that problem is that you have a novel virus, something that's very new to the entire human population's immune system. And so people are much more susceptible to it. They don't have any past exposure, past immunities. It tends to be more virulent. And then, of course, it's contagious. It can spread around the world more readily. That's really what pandemic refers to, is that you're dealing with a novel virus. Yes, God yes. There's a movie coming out called Yes, God Yes. You remember the girl from uh, Stranger Things and uh, we're kind of like running low on content so I'm going to jump into another pro-Jeebus movie. God, yes, comma, God, comma, yes, 
Watch as an older sister from Stranger Things struggles with her relationship to God in an even growing world where without God, people are horrible and miserable. Only through the faith can we truly achieve what is missing. And if we were still missing, then it's God testing us. You know, it's, it's also the solution and the problem, all that stuff. This movie is testing me. I tell you what, uh, it's a dramedy, not a comedy. So the whole idea is it leans more on the drama side with a little bit of comedy. And a little bit of the synopsis basically explains that she I I explores her body. And she's like, oh, I'm going to do things. And then, and then now she has a crisis of faith and she has to deal with uh, um, her urges when she meets a cute boy. Because, you know, obviously when you're, in a ro when you're in a kind of a dramedy or anything like that, you always have to add a, 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 a cue, a love interest... And it basically kind of surrounds the plot of that love interest. It's it's kind of sad. It's not original. Um, Shadow of Violence or Calm with Horses. A movie so divisive that it can't even decide what title they want this movie to be. A uh, movie comes along and changes its title to get people who, are li who I guess, like horses uh, on board for a movie. Shadow of Violence or The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Shadow of Violence. Anyways... We have a tough guy from Ireland, because in Ireland you have to be tough, it's just the way it is. Um, you fight for the other guy, and when you fight each other, you, usually, you know, the only reason a lot of times they fight each other is because they like each other, but they don't know why they like, hate, like, hate each other or they like each other, so they fight anyways, and people are just like, why are you fighting? You like each other. Oh yeah, okay, we'll stop fighting. Okay, so the whole point of this movie is that one's like a drug dealer, and he just is like the muscle for a while, and then he gets told to kill, and he's like, I don't know if I'm able to do this for you guys. All right, well, then we're going to kill you. I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And that's the kind of movie. It's called Calm With Horses. Uh, that's like the last poster, as you can see right here. Um, well, wow, they uh, we went from uh, kind of a heartwarming God movie to drugs and murder, and now let's just go to plain genocide. It's called um, Destroy All Humans. It's a video game that was released many, many years ago. And now they're getting a re-release, just a new skin. That seems to be a, a kind of a new thing with the whole uh, uh, additive of 4K. People are just like, oh, we want a fresh coat of paint when it comes to our video games. So Destroy All Humans, it's about an alien who comes to Earth and uh, basically has to harvest brains. And does stuff, and I'm thinking that a lot of things. So, of course, the mission uh, is all normal and stuff, but then there's mystery to kind of keep you intrigued, but it's mostly just a, uh, kind of like a sandbox game where you get to enjoy destroying humanity. I don't know. It's uh, definitely what a lot of mom groups are going to be against violence, so this is not the game for a lot of those parents. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that, and I have a new episode of Dubbin' Stuff called um, Killer Shrews. What, let me just double check to make sure that is correct. Um, yeah, Killer Shrews. It's a movie that I dubbed over. So here's that, and then when I come back, I'm going to talk about some city council, so stay with me. I guess we could go over here. All right, guys, this is my moment. Uh, my moment to shine, and you have to listen to me. Things are going crazy out there. Things are pretty crazy. Oh, dear Lord. Hmm. You were moving those glasses that aren't as earnest as you thought they were. Now put them back on. Oh, oh man. All right, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to yell at you. I just, I just want attention. And this is my moment to shine. Okay. Um. Oh man. Being the new sheriff in town is really difficult. I have to hold a gun. All right. Kind let's of get you in here. Well, what, You're what's gonna going be on? okay. All right. Take a seat. You're going to be fine. <clears throat> you might be wondering what's going on with this guy. Now let me tell you. He's a drunk. A sad, sad drunk. Now you listen here. You don't talk to him like that. He is a very... He comes from a bar. Doesn't make him a horrible person. Okay, okay. Don't get your pennies in a bunch. We're going to need him at the top of his game if we're going to survive this night. Besides, don't you have a gun? Aren't you going to defend us? It's, this is a crazy night. Well, your silence says that you're probably not going to help us, but uh, hey, you know, listen. Listen, my me? moment to shine is going through that door, and I'm going to come out a hero. Oh, uh, that, my boy, is a window. Do you actually think that you can go through a window that easily? Listen, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Good, bad, drunk. There's so many different things about this place that you have to think about. I'm not trying to make you angry or anything. I need to get out of here. <laughs> this place sucks. 
Oh, oh geez, you got cut. Now it's my time to shine. Gun! All right, I got you. Oh, no, I didn't. Gun again! Ha-ha! No one can stand my stand. Gun, are you okay? You look like you've been, uh, scratched. I'm gonna be okay. I'm just gonna... I think gonna... you need to go to the hospital. Come on. Oh, no, no, I'm fine. I'm just gonna write an editorial about this. Dear USA Today, I do not like these animals that just come into your houses, scratch oh. your ankle, and yeah. screw. Blah, 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 blah. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Can't you see you're doing the, the shooting wrong? Here, I you can't shoot him when you can't really see him. Difficult to write. Unless you can see through doors, you really can't shoot those things. And that's when I decided to have a heart attack, and so people would pay more attention to me. Oh, don't listen to him, oh. you're just faking it. Whoa! Oh, wow, that's some good no, acting I right there. Really I only did have two of those monsters! We, those monsters could kill us! I was in Missoula was uh, officially uh, passed as of the last couple weeks. It, uh, affordable Housing Trust, which was put into place, and uh, now the, a lot of uh, public comments are moving towards how the city handled, uh, um, I guess, um, what's that called? The June 5th incident and how the changes, uh, how the charges for the man who illegally detained the young black man. Um, this is Rabbi Lori Franklin, and she reflects on Missoula's community they kind of took the law into their own hands and were acting as accessory to the police without any uh, permission. And I actually trust our police. Our police are remarkably trained in uh, not just the usual policing techniques, but also in implicit bias and in de-escalation and um, more of all of that is better. So the situation that took place, which was um, that our police took a cue from armed white men who were uh, pursuing a young black teenager and took him into custody and did not take anyone else into custody for questioning really disturbs me. And because maybe it's not, shouldn't be surprising to me, but it's, it is surprising that they took their cue from basically vigilantes, self-appointed protectors, who in fact I consider to be domestic terrorists. You know, if people form a posse with guns, with intention, to uh, make a policing force without any authority, they have taken upon themselves something which they simply cannot do. Lori Franklin was disappointed that there was no felony hate crime and that the charges were not as substantial as they could be. Uh, on the other hand, uh, any further hearings would be any kind of civil case. A lot of times, uh, you know, any further cases and moving forward as well can be charged against that specific person. So if you are an organization and you feel, if you're a person who feels like they've um, been, um, I guess, targeted by certain groups, um, you can always refer reference to the Montana Human Rights Network. They're based out of Helena, and you can find find more information about it for mhrn.org. Um, Mrs. Romero is concerned that the budget is going towards police more than the people in need. Well, the mayor was quoted as saying that our budget is a reflection of community values. If that is the case, why is $19 million being allocated in our city's budget for the police department and only $2.2 million for housing and community development? City council members and the mayor are very aware that affordable housing is of utmost dearly important to our struggling community members that sustain the city and and yet the people's money is being siphoned off to don the police department with military grade gear and tactical vehicles that only contribute to street intimidation and showing off cool techie equipment gear among each other. I know Ms. Ms. Romero goes into more detail and then says that the community, a community, a true community is planting trees, community gardens, after school programs, and by putting more money into police than mental health and po uh, poverty issues. Let me restate that. She's concerned that people are putting more money into police than they should be putting into uh, mental health, uh, poverty issues. Um, by August 24th, the city plans to pass the 2021 budget, which would see $23 million in capital improvements. Missoula Police Department requested um, $892,000 
for their uh, annual budget. Um, Andy Housel reflects on an, incident, uh, on an incident which required mental health emergency. So uh, with the help of a couple of other friends, we made some phone calls only to find out that still there is no one um, in this communi community whom you can call to aid a person in a mental health crisis other than a law enforcement officer. This continues to be a problem. We called Western Montana Mental Health Center and we're told that they are not allowed to go go out into the community. So we could, of course, bring this person to them, or we could bring this person to Providence, or we could bring this person to, you know, St. Pat's ER. I know those things because I've been in that situation. Um, as a social worker who used to go into homes, I have been called for kids who are ungovernable or who have run away or who are uh, threatening to commit suicide. And unfortunately, those safety plans beyond their therapist, beyond their in-home worker, always involve the police. During public comment, Andy mentions that people with mental health crisis are 60% more likely to get shot and there is no one else to help but police officers. Many police officers aren't trained up to de-escalate situations with people with mental issues um, or mental health emergencies. Police officers have a hard position that either needs to be trained or specialists that could be added to uh, alleviate those situations as they arise. Um, City Council members Stacey Anderson later in the meeting responded to the overall lack of mental health funding within the state. And many of you have heard me say this and I will continue to say it until these, cu these cuts in this budget are restored, but in a special session during the 2017 legislative session, they drastically cut mental health services in the Department of Health and Human Services. The Republican-led legislature did that. And we immediately saw a drastic impact here in our community because caseworkers were cut, mental health services were cut, and we have we need the state to be funding those things so that those folks who need those services have access to them and have a stability in their life by having access to their caseworkers. And when the legislature cuts the budget, you know, we at the basic community level then need to help provide a gap for that when we have no funding mechanism to do so. As same with the federal government. A lot of our housing subsidies and things like that come from the federal government. So we need good partners at all levels to really make our community work. And so I want to highlight that and continue to encourage people to read out, reach out to their state legislators, as well as the federal government to fund all the things we care about. Let's change things up a little bit. We're going to change it to something that's a little more uh, lighthearted within the community. Uh, the Roxy Theater is planning to build an annex, additional space on the fourth screen for movies. Um, Roxy Theater has also been a big part of... Uh, providing a lot of like outdoor movies and stuff like that and uh, sponsoring the uh, um, Oregon, Oregon Park, the Paddleheads baseball field where they show movies. Um, and for many of you, though, those of you who don't know what the Roxy Theater here is in Missoula, it is a smaller theater um, that kind of picks up a lot of those indie films that don't play in uh, mainstream movies. And it's been getting a lot more popular since um, it's basically been the source for indie movies in Missoula for the last four or five years. Um, but before that, it was the Wilma Theater. So just giving you kind of guys a little bit of background. And they want to add a whole fourth screen and also an annex with an like, outdoor patio and stuff like that. But here's uh, Caitlin McCafferty with Developmental Services uh, shares a little bit of the blueprints to this new addition to the Roxy. As you can see, the Roxy annex site abuts the current Roxy Theater and is a part of the larger Humble, Humble Building. Right behind the annex on the image labeled Alley East Elevation, is where the Roxy Garden site is proposed to be. This is the current site plan. Um, right here at the top is the Roxy Annex, and right behind it is the Roxy Garden. This is a zoomed in look at the floor plan for the Roxy Annex. And this is a zoomed in look at the Roxy Garden with a floor plan. This floor plan shows um, less seating than possible, um, labeled to maintain social distancing during COVID-19. The Roxy Garden will have paving, removable seating, the screen, which is located on the left side, um, and a fence to designate the boundary. Public comments on this will be open till next week uh, and they when they will vote on this. Uh, this meeting was about an hour overall. It was a relatively short meeting. Uh, there were more public comments that I couldn't understand because a lot of them didn't um, introduce themselves um, and a lot of them were having some kind of connection problems as well. Um, so um, 
if you want to watch more of those public comments, there's, there was a lot more um, in-depth uh, meaty stuff that happened during this meeting as well that I just couldn't add to it. There's just a lot going on, but um, if you want to get in contact uh, with, uh, if you want to get, um, if you want to connect, you go to ci.missoula.mt.us or subscribe to the City of Missoula's YouTube channel. Look up City of Missoula and you'll be able to find it. But also, as always, you can go to MCAT.org for all your uh, local Missoula broadcast needs uh, to find these meetings and more. But other than that, um, up next, I'm going to be talking about some school board stuff and how they're moving forward with uh, starting school up and how they're going to start school and what the school year is going to look like for a lot of kids in Missoula County. Uh, so, uh, before that, here is the latest COVID-19 update from Cindy Farr. Hi, my name is Cindy Farr, and I'm the Incident Commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Thursday, July 30th, and this is my daily briefing. We've had 241 cumulative positive cases in Missoula County to date. That's up nine since yesterday. 238 of those cases were identified by testing, and three were epi-linked. We've had 176 recoveries and one death. One Missoula County resident and two non-county residents are currently hospitalized in Missoula County. We have 64 active COVID-19 cases with more than 243 close contacts. Active cases and their known contacts are in quarantine and isolation and they'll continue to be monitored and supported as needed. The state of Montana is reporting 3,814 cumulative COVID cases, which is up 138 from yesterday. There are now 1,519 active cases with 69 active hospital hospitalizations across the state. There have been 55 deaths related to COVID-19, which is one more life lost to COVID-19 since yesterday's report. Yesterday, I planted the seed for a deeper dive into some epidemiological data today, which is what I'm going to run through in this briefing. Now that we've been tracking information consistently for months, we're better able to actually see the COVID trends. Looking at data takes time, especially any health data. We need time to have a clear baseline and see the changes across time. While we have all of this data, we also know that and want to be know and want to be very transparent about its limitations. All data has limitations and it is best practice to self-disclose those limitations. Some of these limits you are well aware of because we've been talking about them this whole time. For instance, delayed test results certainly are a limitation to the data set that we currently have. It doesn't diminish the value of the data, but it still must be taken into consideration when reviewing it. I'd like to hit on a few highlights today and then invite you to take a closer look at those charts as you have time, and those are posted on our website at missoula.co slash cvirus. There's a link on the right-hand side of the page. Our most recent report captures data up to and including the prior week. The report posted this week includes data from last week when we were reporting 221 cumulative cases. With that data, we can see some of the following. About 48% of those cases were reported in females and 51% were reported in males. About 51% of those cases were connected to a known case. More than 75% of the cases reported are, are reported within the ages ranging from 18 to 64 years of age. What's interesting is when we look more closely at COVID in Missoula County by age, it's unfortunate that at the outset of this pandemic, the message was something like COVID is an older person's problem. At that time, this is what it looked like and what early case information pointed towards. However, with more time and more cases, it became abundantly clear that COVID does not discriminate. COVID-19 can and will affect anyone at any age, and much like other dis respiratory diseases, those folks that are already living with pre-existing medical conditions are more at risk of contracting COVID-19 and are at more risk of having adverse outcomes if and when they are affected. If we look at the data from Missoula County, we clearly see that COVID is affecting all age demographics, but is particularly prominent among younger adults from the ages of 20 to 39 years of age. About 34% of those cases, the, the 221 cases up through last week, are within individuals that are 20 to 29 years of age, and about 19% of those cases are in 30 to 39-year-olds. This means that more than 50% of our local cases are in young, the young adult demographic. The remaining cases are distributed across younger ages from 0 to 19 and older adults from ages 50 and up. I'm reviewing this information in more detail today not to point fingers at people or different groups of people, but to show the reality of COVID in our county. Everyone needs to continue practicing safe behaviors, keeping their social circles small, 
and carefully evaluating harm and minimizing the risk. Of our, our most recent data indicates that Missoula County has a 0.9 reproductive rate, also known as the R value. This means that for every one person who contracts COVID-19, they spread the virus to 0.9 people or just under one person, which is really good. The goal is to keep that R number under one. Um, we can tell if transmission is growing or slowing based on that number. And a 0.9 tells us that we're right on that on the edge, riding the line between managing COVID and having COVID expand its reach here in Missoula County. For context, Western Montana, for Western Montana, the R is at 1.3. The state of Montana is at about 1.5. And Yellowstone County, now reporting more than 500 active cases, is at 1.5. Another indicator is a positivity rating, which is a percent of the total positive tests divided by the number of tests that have been conducted. Our positivity here in Missoula County is at about 2.56. For context, Gallatin County is at about 5%. States like Arizona and Florida are between 20 and 30%. This data helps, this data point helps inform decision making from reopening jurisdictions to schools or businesses. Some states are using 2% as a good positivity rating, while others are looking at 5% as their benchmark. Either way, evidence indicates that places with rates 2% and lower are in pretty good shape, and we're just over that mark. All right, I hope this information helps a bit. We're, we continue coordinating with the University of Montana and meet routinely throughout the week in addition to weekly epi meetings to discuss the new data. We continue keeping an eye on a lot of the data points and using that information to inform our decisions moving forward. So keep an eye on our, our county website at missoula.co slash cvirus as we update those epi charts weekly. We're also working on a more formal epi presentation in the coming weeks to be delivered by our friends at the University of Montana. So that's it for my daily briefing today. Until next time, um, stay cool and mask up for safety. As always, you can subscribe to me on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr. That's C-I-N-D-Y, F-A-R-R. -R. Click that little notification bell so you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Facebook at the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page. You can check out our website at missoula.co slash cvirus. And you can call 258-INFO if you would like to schedule a test through our testing clinic or if you just have general questions about COVID-19. So until Monday, everybody, stay healthy. As I said before, schools are looking to reopen and take it day by day, but MCPS has not decided on what they do, want to do officially. Uh, they have their own phasing project, uh, uh, I, uh, phasing um, deal, and so far they're tracking phase two, which is which Montana is currently in. This limit would put a damper on teachers and staff that fall under the at-risk category. You know, they have a pre-existing condition in their health. Um, they're over the age of 55. They're considered seniors. Uh, the biggest is the social distancing between students at schools and on the buses. August 11th uh, plans to have the school board meet in person with an option to connect digitally. Um, so that this week as well, they're trying to launch an academy. So this is Superintendent Rob Watson talking a little bit more about their online academy. Um, I've asked, um, and she's accepted, uh, Ray Cooper is our tech director. I've asked her to fill in for a semester as our online academy uh, principal. So I've asked Ray to serve as the principal of the MCPS online academy, at least for a semester as we just get our feet under us and determine what that new platform looks like. Um, as you recall, I mean, that's an option for students under phase one and phase two, we wanna make sure students have that 100% uh, virtual remote option. And even at 10%, that's about 900 students. So we wanted to make sure we had a leader in that position that could help coordinate those efforts. With the increase of moving forward and social media and connecting with students, messaging and all that stuff, and um, many of the teachers and staff to connect with students as they work through phase one and phase two, which could see a lot of kids using online resources rather than going face to face in their schools. Uh, the district's attorney, Elizabeth uh, Kaliva, talks a little bit more about that. It's just that when you do put um, information on your social media page um, as a trustee, you want to ensure that it's always public record. So there are going to be sometimes that you get information that comes to you that's not always necessarily already public record. Um, so it's a good idea just to, to double check and make sure that anything you're gonna post is something that should be posted at that time. And of course, during these meetings, trustees uh, 
using these official accounts would have to be, by law, be on the public record. Um, this is something that's kind of... Um, when you when you're doing when you're using social media for official public school business, a lot of that has to be put into the record and recorded in its own right. Kind of like um, for a lot of like um, videos when they're uh, doing live streams on Facebook, YouTube, and they have a comment section. Those comments are put into public comments and officially into those meetings as well. So that's part of kind of like the changing world that we are in and they wanted to kind of address that within um, the school board as well. So um, they spoke in length about this and how to interpret this, but let's move on to uh, the presentation to update the school board regarding the most current plan for restarting school following COVID-19 closure from last spring. Here is Superintendent w Rob Watson talking about it. But this document really kind of explains the phases and, and I just want to be really clear, the phases are have the same name as the governor's phases, but um, just because the state is in phase two doesn't necessarily mean that we as a district um, are, are in phase two, or if, or if we decide, if the state decides to move to phase three, it doesn't necessarily mean that we as a district will decide to move to phase three. I think we really need to be cautious. The nice thing about um, MCPS, if you go to the website, mcpsmt.org, you can look at the most updated version of COVID. They have a, their own little COVID tab, right, COVID tab of the MCPS's website. So far, MCPS says that phase zero is all online. So this is the whole idea of there's like a lockdown or whatever. Phase one, which would be a hybrid model, which would have physically distanced kids in a block schedule where half would go to class and half the time would... Uh, would be online pilot programs as well. Phase two would be the closest to normal school, but with limited interactions between students, which would see modified school schedules. Uh, one idea would be to keep kids in single locations with teachers changing rooms. High school, unfortunately, a lot of kids have to actually go to those uh, different classes. Um, there's a lot of different um, variety of classes that the kids go to. So a lot of... Um, um, would they want to figure out a way to uh, limit um, connect um, social they want to limit uh, social interactions in high school as well so they're going to try to figure that out maybe just have a, a direct path signs and also the one of the biggest things is that MCPS is requiring face coverings and limited face coverings for students who forgot their and they would also provide face coverings for students who didn't bring face coverings as well so for online learning, learning uh, they're asking that anybody, any parents who are concerned, uh, do solely online learning for the first semester. It's it's a it's a way for them to uh, uh, solidify this online academy. And part of this is that they want to say that if your kid wants to go back to school during the semester, they're going to have to wait to the second semester to officially enroll. They're treating this more like how they transfer students between schools, but this would be like just solely the online academy. Um, Rob Watson reacts to uh, the governor's orders for masks and businesses, but left it up to schools to decide what they're going to do moving forward. And this is what Rob Watson had to say in terms of masks. In school. And so I think out of an abundance of caution, I wanted to start in phase one and just see if our restart of school had any impact on the community rates, um, because um, it's a it's a big leap of faith. And, and of course, we're watching the data. But you know that our schools and our community are very closely related. So I wanted to see also, you know, does the fact that we go back to school, does that have an impact on our on our case counts in our community? Even though phase one is only 16 days, it's spread out over almost four weeks. And so that would give us time too to kind of see if the fact that we went back to school had an impact on case counts. So it is, I guess, a long, long answer, I'm sorry, but it is out of an abundance of caution, but also some a research study that I looked at that related the type of schedule and how, how it impacts transmission. In many ways, MCPS is playing with the idea that they may have to close their school at a moment's notice and wearing masks can do a lot. Part of their uh, online presence is that they want to provide online uh, uh, capability first and foremost with the option of having um, face-to-face uh, cl typical classroom settings and whatnot, but they want to, they want to um, create a, a place where they're able to basically leave school and still have school provided for the kids as moving forward. So far from this meeting, the major motion put forward is the operational online learning for parents and their students for any fears regarding the cultural climate. Um, the online academy is available for anyone who wants to enroll. Um, MCBS wants to uh, open light 
but will constantly be notifying parents and staff moving forward. Um, from what I see, they just re released um, the the school year and when the school year is going to start for um, middle school and high school, uh, late elementary school is going to start on August 26th. Um, and I believe that sometime in September, that's when the early K through five will be starting in their school. Um, but of course, uh, any information regarding uh, COVID-19 is provided on the mcpsmt.org via the COVID tab. Um, and this concludes my school board, board report. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for you, my morning show. I had a lot of content. I wanted to show you guys and talk a little bit more about that as well. I did notice I, I did kind of struggle through a lot of things here and there because I was looking at my notes and was like, what, is that how I write? No way. All right, anyways. <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening in the world today, moving forward. There's a lot of people who are pressuring um, uh, public health officials um, into reopening a lot of things. But that's not the kind of idea that we should be really looking into. I'm not a health expert, so when a health expert tells me that I probably shouldn't be doing something, I'm going to try to listen because their whole ideology is public safety and health of the community. So when they, they usually don't stretch their muscles and they don't really flex on people. Uh, but when they do, it's the perfect time to listen. I'm not soapboxing here. I'm just saying is that I'm not an expert. They are. And that's something that I want you guys to take away as you go into this weekend. Weather's really nice. Um, go outdoors. Um, bring a mask no matter what. Think of it as just wearing a shirt, <laughs> shoes, and all that stuff. Just something that you should always have with you. It's easy to have, and it's you know it's a it's a new normal that we're living in these days. So, take care, and I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramsey.